In this lesson, let's continue our conversation on refrigerant safety. Okay, this is a continuation of a lesson that was refrigerant safety part one. But let's start talking about refrigerant cylinders, okay? Refrigerant cylinders have a service pressure, a test pressure, and a burst pressure. Now, R410A, the service pressure is 400 PSI, the test pressure is 500 PSI, and the burst pressure is 1,000 PSI. What this basically means is service pressure is normal operating pressure, okay? Test pressure means what has the cylinder been tested to? Okay, that's a high end of our pressures. Burst pressure is the expected point that the cylinder will actually explode. Now, every recovery cylinder has to be marked. The DOT specification and service pressure markings are stamped on the recovery cylinders. These markings are water capacity, tear weight, data manufacturer, most recent test date, and last allowable retest date. The water capacity is equal to the weight of an equivalent amount of water required to completely fill the cylinder. Their tear weight is the weight of the empty cylinder. These pieces of information are used to calculate how much the refrigerant cylinder can safely hold. So when you take a look at the side of a cylinder, you see a WC, okay? And in this case, it says 47.7. This cylinder can hold 47.7 pounds of water. It also says TW 28.1. That means the recovery cylinder empty weighs 28.1 pounds. According to AHR guidelines K2009, it says that re refillable cylinders used to recover in for refrigerant must be inspected and hydrostatically tested a minimum of once every five years. Okay, this is also an OSHA regulation. Okay, Title 49 CFR Section 180.201. The date of manufacture and the retest dates are st stamped onto every cylinder. The first retest date gives the month and year that a cylinder must be requalified. The first five years starts when the cylinder is made, not when it's purchased. Okay, so it could be stamped sitting in a warehouse someplace for two years. You have already lost two years out of the life of that cylinder. A cylinder that was made two years ago can only be used for another three years before getting requalified, even if it has been sitting on a shelf. If the retest date has passed, the cylinder should not be used, be used until it has been retested. When it is retested, the date it was retested will be stamped on the cylinder. Some cylinders also have last permissible use dates. These are commonly known as 5 plus 5 cylinders. They can only be requalified once. The cylinder may not be used past the last permissible use date. This is because the constant pressurization, depressurization, repressurization eventually starts making weld joints um, delicate. This is an example. The cylinder was manufactured in 07-98. Okay. This cylinder was manufactured in o March of 1997. Okay. It says manufacture date. It was retested in March of 2002. Okay. And it, the last time you can use it is March of 07. AHR guideline N2008 is a guideline for a assignment of refrigerant colors. Okay, it addresses suggested colors for every refrigerant container except recovery. K209, guideline for the container for recovered non-flammable, specifies that recovery cylinders must be painted gray with a yellow top, top regardless of the type of the refrigerant in the cylinder. Cylinders must be clearly labeled with the type of refrigerant since they could they contain since cylinder color cannot be relied on. In other words, you put refrigerant in an empty recovery cylinder, you have to label it. The only thing without a label is that you know for sure is that the refrigerant of the cylinder is not new. The EPA requires that any cylinder containing recovered refrigerant that is classified as a class 1 CFC or class 2 HCFC must contain a warning cylinder that states 
contains refrigerant type, which harms public health and environment by destroying ozone in the upper atmosphere. That has to be on every recolory cylinder. Now, different refrigerant colors. This is for new virgin refrigerant that you have not used. Okay, CFCs, HCFCs, and HFCs all have their own refrigerant colors, cylinder colors. These also appear on temperature pressure charts, but they are also labeled with what's in them. The cylinder should not be labeled. The recovery cylinder should be labeled with a DOT green 4x4 diamond of a non-flammable gas. The contents of any pressurized cylinder will increase in pressure if heated. As long as the cylinder still has some gas in it, the gas will compress and rise in pressure would normally be slow enough that the built-in safety devices can relieve the pressure when it exceeds 150% of the cylinder service pressure. However, the cylinder is completely filled with liquid, a relatively small rise in temperature can create a very quick rise in pressure. Liquid is not compressible. A cylinder that is filled with liquid can go from 1,000 or 100 PSI to well over 1,000 PSI by simply warming it up 10 degrees. The relief disc or relief valve on recovery cylinders will be able to relieve the pressure fast enough before a violent explosion can occur. Can occur. This type of dramatic increase due to liquid expansion is called hydrostatic pressure. Be very careful when you have full recovery cylinders on your trucks and you park in the sun someplace. Your truck temperature can heat up enough that it can rupture the pressure discs on full refrigerant cylinders. Always try to park in a shade. Also, to prevent this type of disaster, cylinders should never be filled with more than 80% full of liquid. And they should not be stored or used in temperatures exceeding 125 degrees. Again, if you have a darker colored vehicle on a hot summer day, it is very possible for the interior of the vehicle temperature to exceed 125 degrees Fahrenheit and rupture cylinders. Be aware of this and try to park in shade. ANSI and ASHRAE Standard 15-210 address the design and construction and operation and testing of refrigerant cylinders. Mechanical considerations include the number, the rupture, or fracture of a component resulting in the release of refrigerant, fire, and explosion. It also addresses the preventation of personal injuries such as suffocation, cardioarrhythmia, toxic effects, corrosive attack, and freezing of tissue. Systems are classified as low probability or high probability within the occupied area. The refrigeration system located in a high probability area must be sized so that a complete discharge of its refrigerant does not exceed a concentration limit set by ASHRAE Standard 34-2010. It does not apply to equipment containing less than 6.6. It does not apply to equipment in certain laboratories and industrial occupancies and refrigerated rooms as long as appropriate design conditions are met. In machinery rooms, Refrigeration has to follow special provisions. Doors must be type fitting, open outward, be self-closing, and be sufficient in number to ensure freedom for persons escaping in case of emergency. All machine rooms are required to have detectors located in an area where refrigerant from a leak will concentrate. A refrigerant detector must activate an audible and visible alarm and a mechanical ventilation system within the space so that the no greater than the corresponding TLV, TWA, which OSHA terminology for acceptable um, values. The alarm must manually be re reset with the reset located inside the machine room. In special cases, ammonia systems require that the mechanical ventilation system run continuously. Failure of the ventilation system should sound an alarm. Depending on local codes, there might be provisions for manual emergency discharge of an ammonia system. Machinery rooms that use refrigerant classified as flammable, that's A2, A3, B2, B3, must conform to Class 1, Division 2 of the National Electrical Code. In addition, some machine rooms must have a manual shutoff for the refrigeration equipment and a ventilation fan switch located immediately outside the room. In other words, I have to be able to shut it down 
and turn on the ventilation right outside the room to clear that room of any possibility of refrigerant. Refrigeration systems need to have some method to relieve excessive pressure that can be caused by fire or some other abnormal condition. Pressure relief valves, rupture discs, or fusible plugs are installed to prevent this from happening. Pressure relief valves may be set to relieve back to the low pressure side of the system or through escape piping safely to the atmosphere. Rupture discs are a one-time failure device that releases refrigerant upon excessive pressure. Fusible plugs melt at a set temperature and will release the refrigerant at a one-time failure device. Rupture discs and fusible plugs both vent to the atmosphere, so they are normally piped directly to direct the refrigerant outside the building. We don't want to have these things rupture and put the refrigerant into the breathable air. This is an example of a rupture disc, okay? And you'll basically see two clamps together. It has a test pressure and everything marked in here. And if that disc ruptures inside of there, it's a one time. And the refrigerant is piped normally outside the building. So again, refrigerant has to follow ANSI and ASHRAE rules. These are safety requirements. They are code and you cannot avoid them. And you just got to be aware of your recovery cylinders and your new refrigerants to make sure that they don't exceed the test pressures. Park your truck in shady areas. Watch the heat. If your truck temperature gets over 125 degrees, it is very possible for a full or overfilled refrigerant cylinder to actually rupture inside your truck. It's a mess you don't want to come back to.